probably my favorite device to talk about this entire semester is the Sterling engine. And there's really two reasons for that. The first is that the Sterling engine has been widely discussed for its ability to convert waste heat into energy. Sterling engines can operate relatively passively without the need to have combustion or other sort of violent processes that we've talked about uh, this semester. And a great demonstration for that actually is from Bill Nye, the science guy, where he demonstrates a Sterling engine in this link here, which I, I of course will include in the description below. The second thing about the Sterling engine that I really like is that unlike the auto cycle or the Carnot cycle, this happens with two piston cylinders that work in tandem with one another. And they're mounted to the same flywheel. And so flywheel momentum is gonna be an interesting consideration during our discussion of the Stirling engine. And the process really begins by accepting heat reversibly from a hot reservoir. And you can see that with the red arrow here on the upper left-hand side. And so we're gonna accept the heat reversibly, which of course means that the temperature inside of the cylinder is equal to the temperature of the reservoir. So this is gonna be an isothermal expansion. And what happens then is as this thing starts to uh, isothermally and reversibly expand, the cylinder on the left-hand side starts to go down. And now that pushes on this flywheel and the flywheel is how we're gonna generate power. And so as the flywheel turns, the other piston is also connected to it. So you're gonna reach a point where you have this maximum volume that you could possibly expand. And then the flywheel will continue to turn, which is actually going to force the piston to start moving up. And that motion where the piston starts moving up also forces gas to move from the left-hand cylinder through this area here into the second cylinder. So of course, as that moves up, the other cylinder has to go down and they can do that approximately at constant volume. And so after this cylinder on the right-hand side moves down or the piston on the right-hand side moves down into the cylinder, now it comes in contact with the heat exchanger or the cold reservoir on the right-hand side. And we are going to reject heat reversibly back to that or to that cold reservoir. And of course, if that happens reversibly, that means that it also has to happen isothermally because T cold has to equal the temperature inside of the cylinder. And then as that happens, the specific volume of our gas in, um, in step three is also going to change. And so it's going to push back up and also take the flywheel with it, which then leads to the right-hand cylinder moving up and then the left cylinder or the left piston moving down. And then it comes in contact with the hot reservoir and that entire process happens again. And so if you think about what is happening in this cycle, the first step is a reversible isothermal expansion the second step is an isochoric heat transfer. The third step is an isothermal reversible rejection of heat. And then the final step is also a, an isochoric heat transfer as fluid really moves between these two, um, these two cylinders. And if we want to think about what that means, from the perspective of our PV and TS diagrams that we've been talking about um, during our course. Well, if I were to plot that, right, and we'll do both of them at the same time. So we'll do pressure and volume, and we'll do the temperature and the entropy. So that first step where we have this isothermal expansion at the, um, at T hot, well, if that's gonna happen, 
in that step, both the pressure and the volume are gonna change. And of course the specific volume goes up and because PV equals NRT, when the specific volume increases at constant temperature, that means the pressure is gonna have to go down. So step one here actually goes from here to this new point here. And then step two is this isochoric motion where gas moves from the left-hand cylinder to the right-hand cylinder. And what that's going to end up doing is relieve pressure because the fluid goes from the hot cylinder into a, into a, a cooler cylinder. So we're going to move down this diagram, right? There's step two. Step three then is we're going to reject heat. And remember what that meant was that the cylinder in the right or the piston in the right-hand cylinder moves up and that causes fluid to actually move from the right-hand cylinder to the left-hand cylinder. And so it, it actually has a compressive effect. So the pressure is gonna go up as the specific volume decreases at constant temperature to here. And then finally, we're gonna get back to our initial condition also isochorically, right? So there's step three and there's step four. And what this means from a temperature and entropy perspective is that remember that the first step happens at T hot. And we're gonna move to the right here, right? In step one. And then in the, in the second step, we have a reduction in the pressure at constant volume. So we're gonna move this way, right? That means decreasing entropy. Then the third step is removing heat at constant temperature. I apologize, I actually didn't go far enough. So we're gonna go this way to here in step three, and then step four goes back here to our initial state. And so there's our PV diagram and our TS diagram for the Stirling engine. And so that might beg the question, how do we calculate the efficiency? Well, just like the other cycles that we've looked at, the efficiency of the Stirling engine is still minus the net work that's done over Q in. And remember, we derived this expression for a cycle, right, where delta U, of course, was equal to zero, but that's still equal to the sum, right? So delta U of the cycle is equal to zero, which is equal to sum of the heat steps plus the sum of the work steps, which means that minus W net just equals the sum of the heating steps. And in our Stirling engine, we only add heat in step one and in step three. So we have Q1 plus Q3 divided by heat in. Of course, we added heat in step one. And so that gives us an expression for our, our efficiency, which is just equal to one plus Q3 divided by Q1. And so now we're left with the task of trying to figure out what we're going to use for Q1 and Q3. And from there, we're actually going to utilize the entropy balance. So we know that the entropy balance is that the generated entropy is equal to delta S for the system minus Q over T surroundings. And we said that this was going to be done reversibly. So that meant that that is equal to zero, but of course not adiabatically. So the system entropy definitely changes during these stages. But what we're left with is that Q is gonna be equal to T surroundings times the change in the entropy of the system for a given step. And so I can write that in our efficiency equation that that is equal to 
one plus Q3, which of course then is just equal to T cold times the change in the entropy for step three divided by T hot times the change in the entropy for step one. And we wanna to try to relate the entropy change between steps one and three. Well, we can do that relatively easily from our isothermal steps because we know that delta S over R is equal to the integral from T1 to T2 of CV over R dT over T plus the natural log of V2 over V1. And so if we have a stage where we know that it's isothermal, that goes to zero. So delta S over R for stage three then actually just equals, if we look up here, the ratio of these two specific volumes. And so delta S over R is equal to, and we'll just call this V star and V double star. So delta S for step three divided by R is just equal to the natural log of V double star over V star. And for step one, this just becomes delta S one over R equals the natural log of V star divided by V double star. Or the most important thing here is that delta S three equals minus delta S one. And in our efficiency equation, that means that the efficiency equals one plus T cold times minus delta S one divided by T hot times delta S one. And that means that the efficiency for a Stirling engine is just one minus T cold over T hot. And this is the same as the Carnot cycle. But the real difference here is that this can actually be built. We can make Stirling engines. We cannot make a Carnot engine. Now the stages in a practically achievable Stirling engine operate slightly differently than we showed just a second ago, or really it's hard since the two cylinders are linked on the same flywheel to have exactly constant pressure steps and exactly constant temperature steps. However, that doesn't mean that it's not possible. And I'll give you a, a couple of, uh, a few illustrations. So there's really three primary types of Stirling engines. So the first one is the Alpha Stirling. And the Alpha Stirling has um, one flywheel, two pistons, but the pistons are mounted to the same place on the flywheel. And so you can see in here where the fluid moves back and forth as the cylinders move up and down. And so this is very, very similar to what we just discussed. Now, the second type of Stirling is the beta Stirling, and it has both pistons also mounted to the same flywheel, but the difference now is that they're mounted on different locations of the flywheel. In that now there's not really fluid that moves between them, but in this middle area, that's where it is compressed and expanded, just like what happens when you move between these two. So the third type of Stirling engine is called the Gamma Stirling. And I actually have one. And so I'm going to fade out here and fade back in and show you the Gamma Stirling, and then we're gonna get it running. Okay, so this is a Gamma Stirling engine 
that is meant as a class demonstration unit and sold by a company called Star Power. And one of the things that you can see is that this front cylinder here, of course, is T-hot. The back cylinder that you can see behind it is our cold reservoir. And of course, it's just open to the atmosphere. So, you know, here's T-hot and here is T-cold. And here is where the fluid is passed between the two cylinders. That section is also called a regenerator. And it has um, a section here in the middle that has a little bit higher heat capacity than, than the, the gas itself. Now, one of the things that I'm doing here is I'm actually running this on, on IPA that you can buy at, uh, or rubbing alcohol that you can, you can buy at a grocery store. And so the hot cylinder here on the left is, um, is providing a little bit of heat and we're gonna just get it started and hopefully you can see some of the principles that we talk about. And down here, we're generating power, right? We're actually turning the flywheel, which has a belt attached to it, which is then turning an element inside of here in a copper coil. And of course, if you rotate a metal element inside of a coil, just like you learn in physics, you generate current. And that's running these four little LEDs here in the front. And so this thing will sit here and it'll run as long as we want it to. And anytime we feel like it, we could remove the heat source and the engine will slow down. If we wanted to, we could reintroduce it to the heat source. Give it a little push. Oops, a little bit of resistance in the line. Oh, almost. There we go. It can start up relatively quickly. Okay. So hopefully you found this interesting, and it's a real physical example of a Sterling engine, which, like we said, has the same maximum efficiency as the Carnot cycle but it's actually practically achievable.